Good morning. I'm going to be very brief so we get to the main attraction. And uh, President Kirshner and I just had the honor of taking the secretary around the, uh, the rooms in the house that have the greatest historical interest. And above all, the library that FDR used as his presidential transition headquarters from November 1932 until he left the 1st of March 1933 for his inauguration. And it was in that room that he and the Brain Trust uh, began talking about the parameters of the New Deal. And uh, I mean, I always start with Social Security, but today is a transportation day. Social Security was created upstairs, but so were the building blocks that became the Public Works Administration and the Works Progress Administration. And um, it's so appropriate because Secretary Buttigieg is making the biggest, is managing the biggest transportation infrastructure project since the New Deal. And we here at Hunter uh, know in our city that the marks of New Deal transportation work are very visible, kind of eternally visible, the Triborough Bridge, the FDR Drive, the Lincoln Tunnel, electrifying what we now call Amtrak, even the transverses across Central Park, one of which on 65th Street we were joking upstairs, it's possible that Eleanor insisted come past this building so her mother-in-law could hear the truck traffic at night for the rest of her time <laughs> here. Um, no favorites. So that's a bit of our proud legacy to which we now add the visit of the secretary today because he holds the key to the transportation future just as we have the record here of inspiriting the transportation past. And with that, I think I'm supposed to invite our special guest to come and join us. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this works. U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Well, how about another big hand for Harold Holzer and President Kirshner for their leadership? The, uh, uh, the, I know the secretary will appreciate this. Um, the only job harder than being president of the United States is being president of a college. Not easy. So thank you for your leadership. I also I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, former New York State Senator Jim Gorin, who is with us. Senator, thank you very much uh, for, for being with us. And let's go right into some questions. Mr. Secretary, again, we're honored by your presence uh, and, and by your leadership. But I do want to begin a little bit off topic, if, uh, if you'll permit it. Uh, here we are uh, at a college. This program uh, is organized and co-sponsored by the Cornell University Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. Cornell University uh, has uh, had to address hate crimes on campus. An arrest was made just several days ago. Somebody who threatened students and threatened Jewish facilities. Uh, hate crimes are up 388%. Anti-Semitic hate crimes up 388% according to the Anti-Defamation League. Our colleges, our campuses are dealing with that. Uh, I think it would be tone deaf to ignore that particularly at a university and a college uh, setting. And so I was wondering, Mr. Secretary, before we talk about infrastructure and transportation, whether you would share your perspectives on what's happening uh, at the present time. Well, th thanks for raising that. And I, I think you're right. We, we can't just step past that without pausing to, to acknowledge the pain and the upheaval that was unleashed by the terrorist attacks uh, and by the violence that, that is unfolding now. Uh, I think the president has, has been clear about uh, both America's fidelity to our ally, Israel, and our commitment as a country to the protection of civilian life. And what we see unfolding closer to home and so close to home, I know for many students or, and for many New Yorkers, is that there are struggles not only uh, between people connected to one religious or ethnic tradition, but just a basic struggle between hate and hope right now. And uh, we need to always remember that the scourge and evil of anti-Semitism is distinct but from the same root as the scourge and evil of Islamophobia. And that whether we're talking about students who have been targeted, not even because of their opinion or position uh, related to the conflict, but just because of who they are. Or whether we think about 
someone like Wadeh al Fayumi, who is six years old in Chicago, uh, who obviously did nothing to bring upon himself the violence that ended his life, uh, that uh, if nothing else, we can remain tethered and grounded in the knowledge that civilians should be safe, children should be safe, students should be safe. And the best we can do in my line of work, even or especially when it feels like the world is on fire, is to try to take care of the basics. Because when we do that, it, it, it can be a better world, even as we work in comparatively uh, uh, quiet fields like roads and bridges and tunnels. Basil. Thank you. Um, I know you had acknowledgments. I have to say this because I'm a teacher and I want to shout out teachers in the room, um, particularly uh, the president of the AFT, Randy Weingarten, president of UFT, Mike Mulgrew. My mother was a school teacher, public school teacher for 30 years, special ed, PS 107 in Queens. So I would not be here were it not for her and for the work that you do. So thank you very much. So my first question is that, you know, there's research to suggest that young people, since we are a college uh, campus, like our students and graduates are driving less. So how does this trend, given the work that you do and given um, all of the conversation around electric vehicles and such, how does this trend with respect to young people um, impact transportation policy going forward? Well, it, it's a trend that, that I think will continue, although it hits strangely for anybody who grew up in, for example, the Midwest in the years that I was growing up in the Midwest, when you counted down the days and the months to when you got your driver's license, it was <laughs> the threshold that represented freedom, mm. right? Uh, there was even a lot of us, if, if you could, you could get a few months credit for driver's ed, and we all did everything we could just to have a few extra months behind the wheel. I think now we're beginning to realize that freedom should be conceived more broadly as having ways to get to where you need to be. Uh, and if anything, there's a certain amount of unfreedom if your streets or your community or your commute are designed so that you can only get to where you go in a process that involves bringing 2,000 pounds of metal along with you when you do. And I think young people in particular are looking for uh, safe, active transportation and transit uh, as alternatives. And that's before we even get into the conversation about automated vehicles, which will very much arise within the, uh, uh, the, the planning periods we're talking about. There's a grain of salt around that because the, the widespread use of, of automated vehicles, which is seven years away, has been exactly seven years away for at least 10 years. And so we need to have some humility about the ways in which that's going to run. There's no question in our time it's gonna make a big difference. I think they say that about a Knicks championship. Oh, was, should I have said that? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. that's terrible. But, but look, there, there's a huge opportunity here because if we can design around that and build for it, it means that there can be more ways of getting where people need to go. I want to uh, go to something rather topical. Uh, the House of Representatives, in which I had the privilege of serving for 16 years, this week, perhaps today, uh, will consider the uh, Transportation Appropriations Bill. Uh, I, I've heard reports from many of my former colleagues on both sides of the aisle that the bill may be in trouble. Um, number one, uh, members of the New York delegation who are Republican feel that the funding levels are woefully low. They're not sure they can support a bill uh, that sets transportation funding as low as the bill that came out of committee. And as a result, number two, the Republican leadership uh, was quoted in Punchbowl this morning, Punchbowl News. Uh, by the way, if you're reading Punchbowl News, you are a junkie, you are a political <laughs> junkie. Uh, Punchbowl News is saying, as, as partially as a result of that, um, there may not be enough votes to, to pass this bill. Now, the economy needs these investments. New York needs these investments. Share your perspective on, on the bill. Uh, and um, the, the uh, terrain around it. Yeah, I mean, look, for, we need to be funded, period, and we need to be funded adequately. And this should not be controversial. I mean, maybe the finer points of it can be, but I, I am mystified that some of these House Republicans would want to cut funding for ports after what happened to our supply chains a couple years ago, or that anybody would want to cut funding for a program like... Uh, uh, like, like the program that we used to fund safety improvements on railroads after what happened in East Palestine, Ohio, this same year. We are, I think, 
very unified as a country, maybe some not so much on Capitol Hill, but pretty unified on a country as a country around the idea we need to do more, not less, when it comes to everything from air traffic control to roads and bridges. And the bipartisan infrastructure law was a, a, an extraordinary achievement because it reflected uh, the, the fact that even, you know, not everybody on the other side voted for it, but a lot of Republicans crossed over to work with Democrats and President Biden to get this done. Why would you try to now move in the reverse direction on funding infrastructure? So my hope is that cooler heads uh, prevail. My expectation is people will be hearing, uh, people on the Hill will be hearing a lot uh, from folks saying, wait a minute, uh, why, why would you cut transportation at a time like this? But we're watching it very closely and we're frankly concerned. A few weeks ago, we um, we saw a story about a, a mudslide uh, where the mud um, and dirt and huge amount of debris fell on a commuter rail track, which snarled uh, transportation for uh, quite some time. So, of course, that raised a lot of questions about climate change. Yeah. How does your department think about climate change and resiliency uh, in in this in this time? So transportation planners don't have the luxury of sitting around debating whether climate change is a mm. thing. We, we had transit in the Pacific Northwest shut down because the cables would have melted if they kept it running during a heat wave that statistically basically should be impossible, but happened. I-70, huge corridor for freight in Colorado, uh, there was a mudslide connected to a drought followed by a flood, and there was a wildfire somewhere in the mix, too, which set up the conditions for a huge chunk, chunk of I-70 to just be taken out. Uh, and there's not a lot of alternatives when you're running between those mountains. This is happening to our infrastructure today. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? Now, the, one of the many, many things I love about the president's infrastructure package is for the first time, we have specifically dedicated funding for resilience. Because the last thing we want to do, if you're on some low-lying area where your road is getting washed out by 100-year floods that are now happening every third year, I don't want us to be funding you, or worse, just ordering you, to put the road back the exact way it was so it can get washed out again, right? So we're changing that approach, and we're putting money behind it to make sure that those improvements happen, whether we're talking about evacuation routes, whether we're talking about sea level rise, that's just in the port of Miami, we're helping them fortify the port there against sea level rise, which is obviously happening to them. It does feel like a strange split screen when I go to testify in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee on the House and find myself plunged back into a debate about the difference between the changing of the seasons and the changing of the climate when any sober-minded approach to transportation planning is already taking this on board, already pricing it in. And we're already working with the states, the transit agencies, the airports, the ports, you name it, to factor in that reality and to try to get ahead of it. So a little bit of housekeeping. We're going to open it up to questions from you guys in about 10, 15 minutes or so. So have your questions ready. I want to particularly encourage students from uh, Hunter and students from Cornell, some of whom took a 5 o'clock bus this morning to be here. Wow. Uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Uh, I want to encourage you to have your have your questions uh, ready. Let me just um, I'm going to ask the audience a question as a way of segueing into a question for the secretary. How many of you remember Felix Rodin? Right. So Felix Rodin was one of the great architects of New York City's economy, helped rescue New York City from bankruptcy. He wrote one of the best books I have ever read on infrastructure. It was called Bold Endeavors. In fact, when we had lunch, I, I recommended it. Bold Endeavors uh, is kind of a Felix's uh, recitation of the most profound and impactful infrastructure investments that the federal government made since the beginning of the federal government. And he argues that every time a na our national economy has faced crisis, we have done one thing to solve it. We have built things. We have lifted ourselves from economic crisis by building things. We're here at the Roosevelt House. FDR, New Deal, massive infrastructure. That was followed up by Dwight D. Eisenhower, Federal Interstate Highway System, now followed up by Secretary Buttigieg and President Biden presiding over another major investment in infrastructure. Talk about that linkage between yeah. building and financing and creating an economy for the American people. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it is the, the literal foundation of our economy. And remember, when we were trying to get this infrastructure bill done, there was this debate over what really counts as infrastructure. And I heard people say some really strange things in, in, in the corners that were against it. Like, uh, you know, some of this funding goes to non-infrastructure purposes like water pipes. And I was just thinking like, infrastructure means infra is beneath literally it's it's the the, the pipes no nothing is more prototypical account of infrastructure than 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 the the pipes that that carry water beneath our buildings but also more richly conceived we did believe that something like broadband internet access had to be part of that and extending broadband to everybody on the principle that everybody ought to uh, not just ought to, needs to have it, that you need economically in order to succeed in life, a connection to the internet is as vital as a connection to the interstate highway system. That, of course, has in its DNA things like rural electrification and the TVA, which, by the way, were a fight. And my favorite kind of fight is the kind where, a political fight, is, is, is where at the end of it, no one can believe it would have been any other way. Nobody today can imagine that we would have just not electrified the entire country. One day, I think nobody could imagine that we would have just not made sure everybody had internet or coming a little more close into my transportation lane would have just not gotten around to fixing the Hudson Tunnel, where we'll be tomorrow celebrating the first slug of funding going into taking care of that because hundreds of thousands of people count on it every day. Um, it's in fact, it's already happening. Uh, that that skeptics have become converts just in two or three years, as happened with so many New Deal programs, where uh, whether we're talking about Social Security or whether we're talking about the physical things that were built, uh, we, we just cannot imagine that it would would or should be any other way. So that's what we're doing. We're building big things. And by the way, not just big things that are big in terms of the price tag and the physical scope of them, like the Hudson River Tunnel or, or the Second Avenue subway uh, or the, the ports and the airports, but things that are big in the context of where they're being built. Some of my favorite, we're going to be doing these multi-billion dollar programs. Some of my favorite events have been visiting places where it's a six-figure grant, but as part of a big vision and in the community where it's happening, changes everything. I, I was in Chamberlain, South Dakota. 2,400 people. But believe it or not, even at 2,400 people, they have an airport. And it's really important to them, not just because of the pheasant hunting economy that turns out to be an important part of their fall season. Big deal there. But also because one of the main uses of that airport is medevac flights that get people to the nearest trauma center, which would otherwise be hours drive away to get to the hospital. So not exactly optional. And their general aviation terminal there is a mobile home. I mean, it's a double wide, but it's a mobile home. <laughs> Dressed up a little bit, but you can tell. And with less than a million dollars funding, we're funding them to get an actual building that will better meet the needs of everybody from the patients needing to be loaded onto those medevac flights to the tourists coming in who keep that economy going. It is a rounding error by the standards of some of the projects that are happening around here. But uh, to, to the people that, that, that I met when we went out there, it, it was going to be a game changer. And being able to do things like that, I think, reflects how the big visions, the bold endeavors matter most because of how they telescope down into the particular. And the most particular space they can telescope down into is everyday life. Ironically, big, massive public works projects, their greatest value is in the fact that we don't have to think about them much when they work. When they don't work, you can think about little else. But when the waterworks is working, and when the tunnel is working, and then the road is working, when the bridge is not doing anything unusual, you can cross that bridge worried about, you know, whatever your next exam is going to be, if you're a student, or, or what your spouse is going to say when you come home, or how your new business is coming along, instead of worrying about the bridge. So there's this funny quality where the bold endeavors are bold in how we build them up, and then they, by design, fade into the background so that everyday life is supported. And what I love most about the work is that relationship between these almost cosmic public works projects we're doing and the way to make it easier for people to just go about their day and not even have to care about the stuff we're doing. It seems to me, and I'd love to hear more about what, how you think about the role post COVID. Because with so much conversation, particularly in New York, about um, people going back to work and going back to the office, there's clearly a connection between employment hubs and transportation hubs. Is there, what's, what's, how, is, how is the department sort of looking forward 
um, in a post-pandemic uh, America with respect to transportation and employment in that connection? Yeah, so I think the way our work patterns changed in COVID, it really taught us two things that we now have to balance. One, it doesn't always have to be the Monday to Friday, nine to five commute to sit at a particular desk and, 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 and put in your FaceTime. It, it doesn't have to be that way. We can be really productive with alternate means. And then at the same time, we learned something else, which is we need to be around each other at least some of the time. It's what makes a city a city. It's what makes a company a company. It's a big part of what makes a university matter, right? Um, in fact, it turns out to be especially true in knowledge work and academic environments. So the puzzle is how do we not just assume you could go back to 2019 and at the same time accommodate a need that is clearly not going away to physically be somewhere in particular? I think part of what it can do is make us a little more efficient because we can smooth it out a little bit instead of cramming everybody down the same expressways and, and, and the same tunnel, subway tunnels at the same time, all the time. Uh, we can think a little bit more about organizations that decide they're going to need people for this meeting or this day of the week or these occasions or under these circumstances. So bottom line is that the need for transit is not going to go away. The importance of transportation is not going to go away. But we can be, I think, a little more imaginative about it. And that's what I see cities doing. It's what I see transit authorities seeking to do. It's what I see employers doing. But we're not really going to know. The new normal, I don't think, is still even from now still probably a few years away and so we also have to be flexible and try not to make any 50-year decisions that will look foolish in five years which is really tough in infrastructure because most of our decisions are 50-year decisions one more from me one more from you and then we'll open it up absolutely all right i want to pick up on something that you said you know, talked about cities uh, and states and those are your key partners uh, in this now in New York, we've experienced a bit of a renaissance on infrastructure and transportation. LaGuardia Airport used to be shoddy. It is now world class. Uh, East Side Access, Grand Central, uh, Gateway Tunnel. Um, these have been uh, just uh, very important drivers of the economy and symbols that we can fix things. But that also depends on the ability of state and local governments to tap into the investments that you are making, the money that Congress appropriates. I know that we have representatives of Governor Hochul here today, as well as elected officials. What would your advice be to those state and local leaders in terms of tapping into the availability of funds? A couple of things. Uh, one, that building consensus pays off. Uh, when you, I just recently had a call from two different governors with different perspectives from different states, but they uh, have a river uh, that they both share and they need a bridge done on it. Um, hmm. So they're, they're great friends now. Um, getting, getting that kind of alignment can be hard won, but very powerful and frankly is needed for us to be a good partner at the federal level. That's one. Um, the, the second thing I would point to is the extent to which this is being processed at a state level uh, or a local level. For every dollar that is in a program that we get to pick and choose based on our criteria in a discretionary process at the department and one day call Governor Hochul, call, uh, call the congressman, say congratulations, you're getting the award for this port or whatever it is. There is about $10 that go right to the state and as long as it complies with federal law, they decide how to use it. And one of the reasons I mention it here is not just for the benefit of, 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 of state officials who might be here, but for the benefit of people who care about transportation. I can feel the uh, level of just cosmic background radiation from fellow <laughs> infrastructure nerds in this room. Um, I hope you are conscious of how empowered you are. Like if you want to testify in Congress, you have to actually be invited, right? Um, but uh, in a city council hearing or a zoning board process or a transit authority board meeting or uh, often a state assembly committee meeting, depending where you live, you can just show up and be heard. And so I hope that citizens, students, residents are conscious of the, the chance that you have to influence the places where many of the decisions are made, even if the funding started in Washington. Many of the most important decisions about what's going to be done with it are much closer to home than you might realize. And my last question is actually a question from one of my students who could not be here because she's working. Um, Sierra Santiago, I'll hold you up uh, and I will ask her question. Um, New York City is about to embark on a big project called congestion pricing. 
Um, heard of it. Heard of it. Uh, <laughs> she is concerned, as, um, as are many, about the impacts on uh, communities of color, disadvantaged communities, uh, poor communities, which might bear the brunt of the plan if they see, if those communities see a lot of people putting their cars there before they come into that specific yeah. zone or suburban communities that might also see an increase in parking and traffic so that folks can avoid um, um, that, that, that zone. So how does your office look at an issue like co uh, congestion pricing and, and protect you know, marginalized communities if there are any of these negative spillover effects? So a really important part of what we do is to make sure that community voices are heard and community rights are protected. Procedurally, we actually don't have a say on the policy. Um, and that's true with a lot of things that are initiated at the state level. So when it comes to what a charge should be, who should be exempted from it, what, what carve outs or, or, or adjustments there should be, all of that is decided. It's an example of what I was talking about being decided closer to home. Where we do come in is the pro a legal responsibility to make sure that community voices were adequately heard. That's, that's why there were thousands of pages of federal paperwork attached to this. And uh, making sure that through things like uh, Title VI, everyone's civil rights are respected. The environmental uh, assessment, and I know, once again, I'm in a, it's a rare time I'm in the room with the kinds of people who would actually page through it and read it. Uh, contains those community voices being expressed and it creates a foundation to then hold decision makers accountable to in terms of whether they are being true to what was laid out in those documents. That's where we come in federally. Uh, what my hope is, uh, just as somebody who obviously watches and cares about transportation policy a great deal, uh, is that the promise of that measure in terms of what it means for congestion, what it means for pollution, and what it means for transit and its potential to, to, to benefit millions can be met and balanced with all of those spillover effects that you're talking about, which can't just be waved away. Uh, they are real. And again, that's why we went through what is an enormous, enormously thorough bureaucratic process uh, to get every one of those questions documented and answered. How about another big hand for the Secretary of Transportation? <laughs> all right, now. You, you are here. Uh, in addition, uh, we have many, many folks who are watching the live stream of this event. I know that there's a Cornell Brooks School watch party in Ithaca that is viewing us, uh, and we appreciate their participation. But let's turn it over uh, to, to our audience. Uh, I know that you have some questions. Uh, Raja, I see it, look, this makes it easy. Let's begin with Eddie Bergman, who, who is here. Microphone. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So it, it, it seems that people just don't pay attention. Their, their heads are down looking at their phones, and uh, there are just so many accidents. Um, and we have scooters, we have, I'm just wondering, is this, is this a New York City issue or is this something that's happening around the country and what can the federal government do, quite frankly, to try to um, make it safer for Thanks. all these different competing interests? Thanks, it's such an important issue. Look, let, let's begin with just a basic national fact. We have a crisis of roadway deaths in this country. It is on par with gun violence, literally 40,000 people a year. And I often wonder why we don't pay more attention to it than we do. And I think it's precisely because it's so universal. It's so natural that all of us, literally all of us, probably know somebody who was killed in a car crash, a lot of somebody's, that we just soak it in like it's something you just can't do anything about. But it is. These deaths are preventable. We are finally seeing the numbers begin to go down, I think five quarters in a row now. Uh, we're a long way from reversing the rise in roadway deaths, but we've begun to see it stop and begun to move in the right direction. But the element that has risen the fastest is pedestrian and road and, and uh, cyclist fatalities, vulnerable road users, as, as they're called. So we need to make sure we design around that. We need to make sure we plan around that. And yes, distraction is a huge part of this. Uh, like everything, it, there might be a unique New York flavor or variety of it, but it is definitely a national issue. This is another area where I think we need to be really nuanced in how we think about technology. 
So level two driver assistance systems, the kind of next move that's now, that really is widespread in automation, does not drive the car for you, but it starts to. Some of the most important technologies I've seen in level two are not the ones that nudge you back in the lane when you drift out of it or decide how far you should be from the car in front of you. They're the ones that notice that you're taking your eye off the road and leaning on the automation too much and tell you, hey, wake up or we'll shut it off. And the different cars do this in different ways. So it's a bit of a two steps forward, one step back with technology here, where technology can be part of the answer, but it's not a, a, a magical panacea if we don't think about how it affects people, especially if there's some other technology like the phone in your hand that is presenting a big part of the problem. Um, I see a lot of promise in some of the technologies that have emerged, um, but we have to go so much further. And then there's another piece, which is just cultural. Just the idea that you need to stop and look around and pay attention. Now, this is something I would actually argue New Yorkers are pretty good at. The way that the, what planners call the you go, I go negotiation takes place. Uh, the kind of eye contact, the, the volume of words that I wish there could be a subtitle of the dialogue that can be exchanged <laughs> Not just through vigorous oh, nonverbal expressions, but yeah, it is a little bit just through eye contact. Um, the, but we need to find ways that, that design can uh, encourage that. And paradoxically, sometimes a little bit less by way of stripes and signs and lights can invite or require a little more by way of having your head up and looking around you. And, and we're looking at that too in our, in our guidance. Uh, one of our Hunter students, Abigail, there you go. Thank you, Secretary Buttigieg, for being here today. My name is Abigail Lieber. I'm a senior here at Hunter College, majoring in urban studies. And my question is, with the pressing issue of climate change, quality public transit is vital to reduce car dependency. Transit projects often face delays due to funding and political obstacles, taking years to get off the ground. How can we expedite the process to get much needed transit infrastructure up and running swiftly in this country? Well, it's a great question. I love how you framed it, which is in terms of climate change. Uh, you know, when, it when we hear about the story of fighting climate change through transportation, EVs are getting a lot of attention, and rightly so. We're excited about EVs, but uh, it's not enough to just maintain the current pattern of how everybody gets around and expect and just switch it to electric and expect that to work for everybody, let alone expect it to help us defeat climate change. We have to create good, safe alternatives and support them, and that includes great, reliable, safe, convenient, affordable transit. So what do we do about it? Well, this is exactly why in, in, in the president's infrastructure package, we have the most federal investment going to transit ever. We've literally never done this much for transit. And it's needed. It's, it's needed urgently. Um, and it is a big part of the fight against climate change. Um, one thing I'm really looking forward to during my visit to New York is, is the Second Avenue subway and celebrating uh, the full funding of grant, grant agreement that's gonna make that possible. Something people have wanted for decades. Uh, we're getting it done. So the, the, then the question becomes, okay, if we got the funding lined up, how about delivery? America is so good at so many things, but <laughs> turns out compared to our peers, prompt, timely infrastructure delivery has been a real struggle here. We've got to beat the odds on that. We've got to beat the curve on that. And we have a whole part of our effort as an administration and as a department focused on that, identifying the obstacles. The biggest obstacle has always been funding. So we've done a lot to tear that down. What are all the other obstacles? And there are many, uh, bureaucratic, political, technical, physical, geographic, supply chains, workforce. Um, but there's such more interesting problems to be working on than the problem of we can't get started because we don't have any money at all. So it's an exciting time for transit. We have some Cornell students who have a, a question. Yeah, please. Yep. We're being very bipartisan, Hunter, Cornell, Hunter, Cornell. Uh, thank you for being here, and I would also like to appreciate you speaking about uh, the difficult time that our university campus has been going through. Uh, to follow up on what my peer Abigail said, um, you mentioned how we also need to rethink the way we um, go from place to place. And like she mentioned, uh, it's a challenge to fund these things. In this regard, um, I, I am personally a high-speed rail junkie, and uh, uh, with regard to the uh, to the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill, um, uh, many public bodies such as 
Amtrak and California High Speed Railway Authority, they've struggled to get funding as well as to complete projects on time. On the other hand, uh, private sector bodies like uh, Brightline, they've uh, delivered fast and efficient um, high speed or relatively high speed intercity rail in Florida. In that regard, uh, what do you think would be the degree of participation from the private sector in uh, transporting Americans from sea to shining sea on a high speed rail? Uh, a great question, and uh, and I think this has been a topic of exasperation for Americans, especially Americans who travel and go to other places and come home and say, why can't we have nice things, right? <laughs> I often said when I was running for president, I wasn't even asking for a Japanese level standard. I would have, an Italian level of standard high-speed train would be pretty good compared to what most Americans in most part of the countries can expect, right? English would be great compared to what a lot of the U.S. can, can experience. Um, although I did have a chance on the sidelines of the G7 transportation summit to, to experience the Japanese Shinkansen train. Sitting in a seat on a Shinkansen train is a, an impressive experience. And sitting up front, which they allowed me to do, is a spiritual experience. You <laughs> see the, the world go by. And you think they've had some version of this since the 60s. And you see the economic development that emerged around it. You think, why can't we have that? As you might imagine, my boss is also enthusiastic about high-speed rail. And what we have right now in this infrastructure package, $66 billion, more than we've done since Amtrak was created, gives us a moment. Now, let me be very honest. It is not enough to build a high-speed rail network from sea to shining sea. It's not even close. At first, we got to take care of stuff like the Hudson Tunnel. But there is enough to restore routes that weren't there before. Uh, and introduce new routes at conventional speeds and begin to introduce routes that, that are authentically high speed. And I believe that if we can make that happen just in two or three people, uh, two or three places, the people in America can actually see and physically experience high speed on American soil, then it's off to the races because everybody else will say, why can't we have one of these? And it'll happen. And to get to your actual question, that will also compel a lot of creativity in how it's funded. I was just on the bright line. Uh, which uh, in, in Florida offers a standard of service that a European traveler, for example, would not be bothered by. Um, and now they had some unique conditions in terms of how they assembled the right of way. Um, but there are other places where things like that could be done. Uh, we definitely don't feel any, th those federal dollars get stretched thin no matter how many of them there are. So we don't, definitely don't feel any pride of authorship that it has to be public sector. But nor should we fall into the idea that it has to pencil out and be profitable to be a good investment. The enormous returns on investments in rail will not always accrue to an investor. They are often social returns that accrue to an entire geography. But anytime there is a structure that can unlock capital because it will accrue to an investor, and by the way, we support this not just with grants, but with things like private activity bonds, which play, now that we're back in a world of normal interest rates, I think are going to matter more than they did a few years ago um, and are part of the story on Brightline. Uh, I do believe that we will, through a combination of public and private capital, enter a period where by the end of this decade, there are enough actual high-speed phenomena happening in America that Americans will refuse to look back. D David? Just, David. There's a riff on a question um, from earlier. Okay, well, first off, I just want to say thank you for coming. I really appreciate it, uh, Secretary Buttigieg. Um, my name is David Oki. I am a first year at the Macaulay Honors Program at Hunter College, uh, class of 2027, majoring in computer science and urban studies. Um, my question pertains to the status for federal funding of transit projects in the outer boroughs of New York City. So <clears throat> the Federal Transit Administration and the <clears throat> Department of Transportation has taken positive steps to improve transit in the, in the city center with uh, Eastside Access Project for Long Island Railroad, the Second Avenue Subway, and the Hudson Tunnels, like you mentioned. Uh, but I think projects to connect the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn, such as Queenslink, uh, the Utica Avenue Subway, Interborough Express, have not seen similar attention from the FTA. Uh, they are not really not considered federal funding. Um, as the executive of the Department of Transportation, I was wondering uh, how do you, would you plan to act adequately address the Growingly urgent need from working class riders in the outer boroughs, like Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, who make up a population of over six million people. Uh, thanks for the question. I'm just looking because I know the the pride that my friend Les Feridov has in his students is is reflected in the in the thoughtful questions that uh, uh, like like the one you just asked. Uh, I could see a twinkle in his eye as you as you stood up and introduced himself. Um, 
Look, one of the core principles of what we're doing with this infrastructure funding is to make sure that people are served everywhere and especially in places that have been overburdened and underserved. Uh, and, uh, you know, Second Avenue Subway is one example of that. The broader problems that you're describing, I think, is critical, especially because it also goes into this equation of housing plus transportation, right? Uh, people, especially low income people, don't get to pay for transportation one month and housing another month. They're part of the same family budget and for lower income Americans can be 40% or more of your income. Uh, and, you know, a, an area and, and, and a, a, a real estate price geography like uh, New York and the outer boroughs demonstrates how good transit options can unlock greater housing affordability for so many people, but only if you can actually get there. And only if we acknowledge that you do not experience travel, actually, in terms of miles, you experience it in terms of minutes. And uh, when you factor that in, you get to all kinds of strange results. Um, I was talking to the mayor of Mount Vernon, who was talking about how even just within some of these uh, communities or, or, or outer boroughs, how it's hard to get around. In fact, one of the things she noted was that for her residents, it's actually easier to get to Manhattan than it is to get across town to buy groceries, uh, which is part of what we have in mind with our reconnecting communities agenda. Um, so we're very attentive to this. It's one of the reasons I'm excited about the, the top line levels of federal funding that are there. Uh, and with things like the president's commitment on Justice 40, that at least 40% of our climate positive investments are going to communities uh, that are underburdened and overserved, it puts some, some mathematical rigor behind that. But again, I want to turn a little bit back to what I was saying earlier, that many of these decisions are a little closer to home, right? We don't think up any projects in the U.S. Department of Transportation. Of the 31,000 transportation projects we're now funding, not one of them was invented in our headquarters building in Navy Yard in Washington, D.C., what we're doing is supporting the projects that emerge and that can build support closer to home to approach us for federal funding so that we can come in and, and try to be a good partner. We will continue to send the signal that one way to score well in our processes is to show how you're going to deliver for people and communities that were left out in the past. Uh, but so much still depends on what comes to us and what comes from the ground up. Uh, and I think that advocacy that you're rightly directing at us uh, can also have a big effect on some of those decision makers figuring out what they're going to prioritize as they approach uh, a department like ours uh, for, for projects and visions like some of the very ones that you named. I think we can take one more question, uh, and I would love for it to be uh, a Cornell student. And well, I gotta, I gotta, well, is that? That's, well, that's, that's all let, right. Can we close it out? We got to close it out. We got to let the right. hunters close it out. I will in the in, in a world where compromise is, in a world where compromise is disincentivized. <laughs> Cornell student, yeah, yes, and then we'll, we'll, Boss we'll, will close we'll, it out. Yeah, please. No, I'm I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but you have had your hand up. Yes. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for being with us. My name is Fati. I'm an undergraduate in uh, Cornell's Hotel School. Um, happy to be here. Happy to have you. Um, my question is about the airline industry. We've talked a lot about high-speed rail and, and all of that. And it's super important, but our country's geography is unique compared to, uh, to Europe. We can't have high-speed rail everywhere, right? Um, currently, the JetBlue and Spirit merger is going through federal approvals. Um, and whether that is anti-competitive or not, can you walk us through your stance on that and what you think about the merger? Yes, but only in very broad terms because it's actively, uh, it's now actively in that process. Uh, but what I'll say is that we decided to change the traditional posture of our department, which was very hands off, and actively get involved and, uh, and support the DOJ's position. And the reason we consider that important is that we actually have an authority and therefore I believe a responsibility that is overlapping and not totally congruent with the DOJ's authorities when it comes to promoting competition. And, uh, and we think it, it, it compels us to get involved in this. And again, I, I don't mean to be cagey, I just can't get more into it while, while it's being um, litigated. But what I can say more at a policy level is we've got to take a look at what's going on with competition across the transportation sector, where we're down to four big class one railroads uh, and communities and even customers feel like they can't get their calls returned by railroads, uh, or where we are in shipping, where ocean shipping is, is 
something of a cartel at this point, or airlines. At the time of deregulation, 30, 40 years ago, it was confidently pronounced that there would be like 100 competitive airlines after they went through that. And instead, we're going through, we've gone through so many mergers that you wonder one day, is it just going to be Coke and Pepsi? I mean, are we going to be down to two, right? And we think it's very important to make sure that the, the public benefit, both in terms of prices and in terms of passenger experience, is supported uh, by robust competition. It doesn't mean we turn back the clock and go back to the Civil Aeronautics Board of the 50s dictating airfares, but you could tell there's something not quite right about where we are now. And that's why we're also within the economic framework that does exist, getting a lot more aggressive on passenger protection. I would argue that, that we're in the midst of the biggest expansion in passenger rights in decades. Uh, a year and a half ago, not one of the top 10 airlines, not one of them, guaranteed in any enforceable way that they'd even get your meals and ground transportation if you got stuck and it was their fault. Now, just about all of them do, and we can enforce it. We got rulemakings on things that ought to be pretty basic, like not having to pay extra to sit next to your kid, um, or getting compensated in an extreme delay, which is already the case in Europe, uh, that we're looking forward to, to finalizing, getting the comments, and then working through and finalizing those rules. Um, I do want to point to how much has changed in a couple of years, because a couple of years ago, we were all talking about the airlines. But the reason we were all talking about them was everybody was wondering if they were about to go out of business. So we've come a long way in terms of restoring the economic strength of this country and restoring the aviation sector. But I would also say precisely because an awful lot of taxpayer money went into making sure the airlines were there uh, and, and thrived and survived. By the way, we want them to thrive. We want them to survive. It's not us against the airlines, but it's us as a regulator taking seriously our responsibility uh, to ensure that passengers are well served and well protected by the airlines. And we're going to be a, a very energetic watchdog on that. So, so Brittany, why don't you take us out? Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Secretary Buttigieg. And okay, okay. Got to stand up for Hunter. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I am a graduate student in urban planning at Hunter College. And um, as I've learned about the history of your department um, and its role of shaping the fabric of our cities. I am also interested a lot in pedestrian deaths in um, sort of a different way. I think people are on their phone plenty in South Korea and the Netherlands, and yet they have less pedestrian deaths than we do. It's actually been the 2022 was the highest um, year for pedestrian deaths since 1981. So a lot of people in our city are very focused on this, although we have some difficulties with things like um, obstructionist local leadership and maybe this sort of growing plague of SUVs and cyber trucks that are killing pedestrians at far higher rates. I think you would agree that some of these cars belong in combat and not down Fifth Ave while walking here. <laughs> so my question is, how are you planning to address this epidemic of pedestrian deaths because something that's very important to us is everyone who walked here and got here on the train. Thank you. So again, we've got to treat this as a crisis. I'm glad you mentioned those comparisons because I, I said earlier this is a proportional to gun violence. Also, like gun violence, uh, it is not the same across the developed world. We tolerate a level of carnage on our streets that is not just the cost of doing business for, for having cars or, or having a modern economy, as other countries have demonstrated. So our roadway safety strategy has, has five pillars, safer streets, safer speeds, safer uh, people, uh, which means drivers, but not just drivers, safer vehicles, and a higher standard of post-crash care. And we're working across all of these. Part of it is just empowering and also funding uh, local jurisdictions to have designs that will be at speeds that are safer for pedestrians. And by the way, this, I remember knockdown drag out fight back when I was mayor of South Bend, because I was going to do something that would have, it was basically, we were we were just starting to call it complete streets. I don't think that term had caught up to us back then, but it was a conversion of what was a four lane, one way highway blasting people through our downtown core urban area to something that was a little more manageable in its pace and its design. 
um, audaciously, we increased the commute time from one end of town to the other in a car from 10 minutes to 11 minutes. And you would have thought that we were banning the use of the automobile. I mean, th there's a lot of deep resistance to this, but we did it and it became one of those things that people would have trouble imagining was any other way. Let me mention the vehicles part in, in addition to the design part. It is time for us to, rec we, have, we have a wonderfully effective regulatory regime to protect the occupants of vehicles. We need to begin expanding our understanding of what vehicle safety means to include anybody who might come into contact with the vehicle, not just those who are inside. And for the first time, and I'll admit that this is an incremental step so far, but for the first time, our new car assessment program is contemplating that. and. NHTSA is undertaking a rulemaking on automa automatic emergency braking, which is also in, in that spirit and will save lives, not just in vehicles, but outside of vehicles. Um, again, I think other technologies can play a big role here, but waiting for technology to save us uh, will cost lives in the meantime, and we can't afford it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Big hand for the Secretary of Transportation.